Park. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome back again. <laughs> You big dummy. Well, I only got 12 <laughs> things you to choose from. You only got an hour to set up, I know. <laughs> well, that too. It, it takes time to get this good, all right? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, what we're going to do is we're going to go over uh, Dave Lalbert's uh, intake manifold tonight. Um, some of you guys uh, maybe have been following his uh, deal on Facebook. Um, Dave's uh, got a... Uh, 72 or I don't know if it's 71 or 72 but he's building the Le Mans and he wants to maintain the factory hood on this thing but he wants to run a Victor intake manifold on the engine he's building for it. So um, we come up with a solution that uh, uh, because we want to run a carburetor spacer too and uh, to uh, help with velocity underneath the carburetor so what we're going to end up doing is uh, this insert that Dave made for his intake manifold is going to end up looking like this on the bottom whenever I get done uh, hand massaging it. And uh, if you look at it, it's got a taper to it. So what that does picks up the airspeed and velocity. Well, if we use a traditional Victor intake, another inch of spacer on here takes up a lot of hood clearance. So what Dave done is he purchased a, a Dominator intake manifold and he cut the center of this out. I'm going to pull this out of here so you guys can see in there. Is this camera on? I no? can go to that camera, yep. All right. And so anyways, if you look down inside of there, what he done is he machined out, I'm trying to get that so you can see it, um, he machined out this uh, intake manifold so that we can put this spacer in there. And he machined out these parts here. Right, because this used to be a for a 41, or a 4500 series Dominator carburetor. I don't know why I can't get that straight on there. Anyway, I don't it's want to make you guys dizzy. <laughs> so, so anyway, what we're going to do is, uh, and so then what we're going to do is we're going to take this thing that goes down inside that intake manifold, and I'm going to make it look like the bottom of this one here is going to uh, simulate this spacer, but instead of having to raise it up a ha an inch, you'll gain an inch of hood clearance by putting this down inside the plenum. And uh, so we came up with this idea. Him and I were talking about, you know, he says he did, really wants to run his intake and he really wants to run a factory hood on the car. And I get it, you know, factory hood's cool if you don't have to put a hood scoop on it. And uh, so I suggested to him, and Dave, Dave's a machine, man. I tell you what, and his brain works like, a, uh, like an engineer. He, uh, all I did was I explained to the, him in about roughly, I don't know, Dave, you're probably online watching, but. I think we, we talked about it for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes. And I pretty much gave brain, uh, Dave my image in my head uh, in words, and uh, man, he nailed it. This is exactly what we were talking about. And uh, so this is a pretty cool idea what he come up with. So what we did was he's making this spacer. We're going to make it look like this tapered one when we get done, but it's going to keep the height of the intake manifold stock. So I don't know if you guys are following that or not. And then uh, what he did was he put a groove around the outside of this spacer and we put an O-ring in that. And so whenever we push this back down in there, it's gonna be sealed up airtight. And then of course, whenever you bolt the carburetor down on it, you got a gasket that goes on here. And then what he did, Dave's a smart, he's a fart smoker. So anyhow, what he did was he came up with a way to remove that thing out of the plenum. He made up a, a little slide hammer with a plate that bolts on top of there, and we can go ahead and he can just we can pop that piece out of there, so that at a later date at the racetrack we can pull the carburetor off and we can try different tapered spacers or an open spacer. Well, technically it's not a spacer, filler. We're going to call it a filler. Uh, we can do an open, do a four hole. We can do a tapered four hole. We can do two big openings. There's it's unlimited what we can do with this intake manifold now. So this is a freaking awesome idea. Now, uh, do you still have to run an adapter if you want to run a 4150? Nope, 4150 bolts right on. So what Dave did is he filled the holes for the Dominator because they have a different bolt pattern with uh, aluminum rod, Loctited those in there, and then he remachined the uh, bolt pattern for the 4150 carburetor. Mm -hmm. So smart little guy. Well, I shouldn't call him little, but smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's what we're talking, what we're doing tonight. Uh, so hopefully you guys got a few questions you want to hear about this. But uh, and Dave's online, I'm pretty sure too, so he can answer any of your uh, questions on machining or whatever. This thing's a pretty tight fit. So, but uh, well, it didn't help that you knocked it down with the slide hammer. <laughs> well, no, it's it's not past the O-ring. So I know, but if you put it in a little bit crooked. Well, I know. I just pulled it up a little crooked. Yeah. But we're going to straighten that out right now. <laughs> yeah, put two of those bolts in and just knock it up a little bit. It'll come out. Yeah, right? Yeah, see what I did, Dave? I broke it already. I'm sorry, buddy. Don't, Dave, lesson to be learned. Don't ever give my dad anything until you're finally ready to be broken. <laughs> no, he did good. <laughs> Look at that. Them bolts go right in there. It's like you made it for this. <laughs> that's awesome. Hey, looky there. See, that's how it works. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> that was, we we're just showing you how it worked. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, you started out with an intake that looked like this. That's the dominator intake. So he took this clover leaf out of there. And he made it look like this one. So now he's got a 4150 4500 intake manifold <laughs> yep <laughs> not really it's 45 4150 but <laughs> but now we got interchangeable inserts that we can put in there and uh, try different things and what's cool about it is you can do it the same day at the racetrack you literally pop the carburetor off bring your spacer with you or your insert pop this one out put the new one in and make another test test so we'll see what uh, works best on his combo whenever it's all put together and he gets a day at the track and uh, gets to play with it a little bit. So you're going to have to read the questions because yeah. I, I can't see them. All right. So we got uh, Philip III said it's a chicken soup uh, for me tonight. Yeah. No beer tonight, huh? And I said, hopefully it's because you like it and not because you're getting sick. And he said, he's fine. That's good. I'm just getting over a cold. Um, and Stephen uh, Crumley says, it's uh, getting so sunny where you when you live stream now. I want to go back to the dark side, 5.30 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and my, I talked my son into putting some lights that reflect off the ceiling. So, you know, I, it was making me look old. <laughs> Can't I, that. I, yeah, that's the lights. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see here. And John C designs says hi. John Don, uh, Dornbush says ready for more Pontiac badassery. <laughs> hey John, I sorry I couldn't get back to you earlier. Uh, I reached out to you about uh, Arnie Beswick because uh, I'd like to do a Zoom with him and. Uh, I'm hoping maybe you're uh, tech savvy enough to uh, help him uh, set it all up so we can do a Zoom uh, podcast with him maybe here in the next couple of weeks. So uh, let me know your thoughts on that. Um, and then we got, sorry, my, my son is texting me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he can wait. We're doing, we got more important things. <laughs> Old School Twist says, good evening. Uh, Bill Rosenberg says, hope everyone stays dry this week. Yeah, Bill, and hey, thanks for picking up those headers for me, buddy. I appreciate that. I still got to pay you for it. I hate Owen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Waylon, uh, are you, are all of you Ram Air 5 camshafts roller? And what's the average price of a bare roller cam? They are all roller. Unfortunately, there's nobody that makes a uh, flat tap at blank for uh, the Ram Air 5 anymore. Iski still has the tooling, so if any of you guys um, know somebody at Iski, uh, I contacted them because I found out they still do have the core boxes. <laughs> but unfortunately, they don't want to dig them out. And you know what? I can't hardly blame them. I mean, it's a dinosaur uh, on top of the fact that it's rare and on top of the fact that it's Pontiac guys <laughs> so, instead of an LS. But anyways, uh, they do have the tooling to uh, make the flat tap at cams, and I would love to do that. Um, but a roller cam, it all depends on the manufacturer you buy them uh, from. 
Uh, they range anywhere from about, uh, they were around $1,000 to between 1000 and 2000 bucks for a cam, but <clears throat> things have been going up like crazy here in the last couple of months, so uh, probably, and I haven't bought a cam in about a month and a half, so it's probably going to be, I'll bet it's going to be between uh, 1400 and 2200 now. He also has a set of factory Raymer 5 heads. Is there any camshaft options for those? Yeah, I mean, it's the same cam as what I use for my head, so, yep. Okay, so what are the Raymer 5 guys using now? They, they we, had we to get a, them all. They had to get a ground one from Comp, or? Yep, exactly. Gotcha. There, there's a couple different manufacturers out there. Comp will do one. Uh, I think Racer Brown will do one. There's, there's a bunch of them will do them, so. Uh, Philip the Third said, um, "Will it raining very hard here, and continue all night?" It, uh, Philip is in Florida, where they're getting some nasty weather right now. Tornadoes, oh, and, really? And, oh yeah. Well, you can keep it down there. I don't yeah. want it up here. <laughs> we're, <laughs> tomorrow's our turn. Yeah, we're gonna get it. We're gonna get it. All, whatever you guys get, you just shove it forward. <laughs> <laughs> shove it north. Uh, Jeff Downey says hello. Hello, Jeff. Uh, Philip Thurst, a clever idea. Old School Twist says, is that legal in California? If not, who gives a shit? But that's pretty good thinking. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Amen. Um, Dave Albers says, hey, guys, I finally made it. And Walt Beatty says, use the slide hammer for a reason. <laughs> uh, Steve says, uh, we had a great race weekend at uh, Brainyard Motorsports Park in northeast Georgia, Chattahooga, Tennessee, a couple weeks ago. It was the Gassers. Those cars can move around crazy down the track. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of that, next week, uh, so I don't forget to tell you guys, uh, uh, our guest for the podcast is going to be uh, Greg Stelzi. I think that's how he says his last name. Anyhow, he's got a 57 Pontiac Gasser. And uh, right now, he would have been on this week, except for he's going to uh, North Carolina uh, for a race down there. So... Uh, that'll be exciting. You guys get to uh, pick his brain a little bit about his uh, 57 gasser. And I think uh, if he hasn't already, he's working on setting the world record with that for the gasser class. Hmm. And um, and it's a manual. Is it four I speed? thought it was, I don't know about four speed, but I'm pretty sure it was a manual. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure on that. I don't know if it's a, I, they might have to run manual in those that hmm. class. I don't know. Uh, that, and, and that's one of the questions I want to ask. I want to find out about it because I wouldn't mind doing something like that, yeah, build a gas or some kind. That'd be fun. Yeah, and if uh, if we can get um, going and stuff, if you guys check out, he has a YouTube channel called Greg's Speed Shop, right? Yeah, he's actually yeah. got a business uh, that he builds hot rods like we do. And uh, so he's... Uh, He's actually up in his game. He's uh, he, he got several uh, contracts. I don't want to talk too much about it because I'm going to let him talk about it, but, but Greg's pretty well connected, and he's got some really cool things going on. Yep. Well, and I just wanted them to go check out his YouTube channel, for one. I mean, get him well, yeah. a little more likes and, and whatnot. I think he's but, got a website, too. So. Um, but <clears> they <throat> can uh, they can see what, you know, that way they get a little idea before we interview him. Yeah, I'll post pictures of his car and everything on uh next week's podcast um marshall says that is really nice high quality machine work my only concern is lowering the bottom of the spacer into the plenum which lessens the time that the air has to turn the corner into the runners i'm sure you guys have a plan for that yeah not really <laughs> <laughs> but we're working on it <laughs> but no it, it, you're right i mean whenever you move the carburetor closer to the plenum bottom it definitely uh uh, gives the air and fuel less time to turn, <clears throat> and that's why carburetor spacers work so well. By raising the carburetor up, gives the air and fuel more time to make that cor corner. But um, uh, if you think about it, it's going to end up being pretty much just like a regular 4150 style intake manifold, except for we're going to be able to uh, manipulate the airflow a little bit with the space with the <coughs> insert that Dave made. Sorry, probably I had a burp. But, uh, and the plenum on these uh, Victor intake manifolds is pretty deep. Mm -hmm. Dave did mill this down just a little bit. I think he took another quarter inch off of this uh, to get, gain a little bit more hood uh, clearance. And uh, even, even so, with everything that Dave's done here, he's still going to have to run a two and a half inch drop base on the air filter. Wow. 
All right, let's see here. Uh, Tim Korsiak um, says hello from Flint, Michigan. Hello, Tim. And Michael Mithin. Is that how you say his last name? I always Mithin, yep. Yeah, um, I always says, want to call him Pithin because <laughs> Michael P. Mithin, but, yes. and, but and, the, and the P and the M kind of blend together. Uh, he <laughs> says, hello, sex guys. <laughs> Sexy guys. <laughs> Uh, John Dornbush says, I don't know beans about that, but maybe one of his daughters could help him or even one of his grandkids. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, it'll give you an opportunity, John, to get on the podcast and be a star. So you can, you can help Artie and you, can, you and them uh, can uh, figure out how to get that camera focused. <laughs> uh, Robert Johnson asked, are there any cruise control add-ons for the 70s vintage Pontiacs? And by the way, he's drinking pale ale. Pale ale. I'm drinking water tonight. I got a cold, so I'm trying to nurse <laughs> that back to health. Um, that um, uh, cruise control, he said? Yep. You know, I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't never seen one. Uh, Did what's they come cruise, cruise control? control? You got full throttle idle. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> it's kind of like brakes. You only need them whenever you want them. <laughs> only when you have to stop. <laughs> yeah, that's when you want them. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do know they make those aftermarket cruise control things, but they're kind of hokey. I've never, I've never installed one, and I, I don't know. I, I've never had anybody really want me to do that. So we've had factory stuff that we've worked with on uh, GTOs and Firebirds and big cars, but I've never done an aftermarket one. Uh, Ed Page says hello, gentlemen. Good evening, Edward. Uh, Cindy Johnson says hello. Good evening. That's my baby doll. And um, Michael said he just <coughs> saw. Two green alligators, two long neck geese, two humpy, humpy back camels. They were all talking about a big boat. Yeah, well, you know what? We're going to need it. <laughs> Sounds like the whole United States is underwater right now. Yep. Especially down south. I've seen Texas is like the bus was driving through somewhere in Texas and the water was up to the mirrors. What? Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> Obviously wasn't an electric bus. No. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, I, whoo. Yeah, then people are going to be like getting shocked by an eel. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, old School Twist asks, do you think that uh, spacer being sunk in the plenum will affect it? Be cool as hell to uh, see if it works and definitely interested to see the differences in the inserts. Um, I think it's going to be okay. I might end up having to take and taper the uh, top of this runner with some... Uh, Belzona epoxy <coughs> or something. I, I don't know. I haven't got to really work with it yet, but uh, I think it's going to work out pretty good, honestly. I think that uh, we're going to have to obviously port the intake manifold and make some modifications to the uh, runners and the and the way it turns into there, but I think that it's, I think it's going to work out really, really well. Do you think that, um, is it, don't they sell like an insert they put in the middle of this and looks like a cone? Yeah, they, got, they call it a turtle. And, uh, and you can do that, too. Um, you know, the other thing is, too, I don't know how thick the bottom is on this, but we might be able to take and uh, machine no, some of the bottom out of this thing, too. There's all kinds of, you know what, if there's a will, there's a way. You just got to gotta put your thinking cap on and not be afraid to take a chance and uh, make modifications. And uh, apparently Dave's not afraid to take chances. You know? <laughs> Especially with these intakes, because they don't make these anymore, right? Yeah, it's hard to get them. I don't know if they're still making them or not. Um, I haven't been able to get a Victor intake manifold for a while, so uh, they're not they're on Summit site, but like they still are making them, but you can't get one. Gotcha. Uh, Philip the Third asked, "Is that the green one with the gas uh, with the Greg Speed Shop on it?" Yes, that's the one out of uh, Wepakanua or Wepakapua, Wisconsin. Yep, that's the guy. Um, he used to run the Great Lakes Dragway in Union Grove, Wisconsin. Yeah, that's a cool car. And they just did some updates to the car. They're, they're serious. They're going to chase after the record in that class. Um, Mark said, Don, I tried really hard to grab your fit to MBJ next month, but management tossed me into uh, thank you. Oh, well, bummer. I was hoping that you would be able to do that, but it, you know, now if I go down the drink, it's going to be all your fault. <laughs> uh, John Dornbush says, "Scare the hell out of everyone seeing me." <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> as long as you got your DCI shirt on, um, I'll have to get one to Arnie too. Yeah, 
Uh, Mark said, uh, all to the whole schoolhouse for simulator sessions. I want to give you the perfect flight. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Let me know if you ever fly American again. I appreciate it, Mark. <laughs> I was just busting your chops, buddy. But yeah, I do appreciate you trying to get that flight. That would have been cool. Uh, I, I, I was looking forward to it, actually. Robert Johnson asked, is there a throttle body, a better option for street use, just for street use? Um, a throttle body. So you meaning... Uh, Probably uh, like if a you have tech or something? EFI? Probably. And, if, and is he wanting a... You know, there's, there are no EFI kits. I just talked to a guy. I feel bad for this guy. Um, just talked to a guy about an hour ago uh, from, from uh, I think he's from Florida. But anyway, this poor guy, he, he did the same thing that we learned here at, at the shop. He, um, uh, he tried the fast. He tried the sniper. He tried the uh, FI tech and uh, ended up wiping the rings out of his engine twice and ruined the camshaft in his engine. Those throttle body injections don't work, guys. You hear guys that make them work, they get them to work, but most of them are small block Chevy guys. And that system's probably set up for a small block Chevy. For whatever reason, Pontiac engines do not like those systems. The uh, only one that I will do, unless I'm building a custom one with like a Holley Terminator uh, and build my own fuel injection setup, is the uh, Edelbrock Pro Flow 4. It's the only one that we will install here for, even on a Chevy, it doesn't matter, but that's the only one I will install. I've had way too much trouble with those other ones. It, it's why I got gray hair, because man, those things just, they're, they just don't work. And, yeah. uh, and I know there's gonna be guys on here that are gonna argue with me. <clears throat> Good for you if you got it to work. I could not, and we tried. And the bad part is the engineers or the tech guys or whatever with all those companies, none of them want to talk to you. And they give you generic answers when they do talk to you that you've already checked. If you're, if you're in this field and you know what you're doing, you know what to check for. You're not stupid. So you're not gonna, they're not going to tell you anything that you don't already know. And the problem is, is they're just phone guys. They don't know either. And they're just going off a card. Yeah, check this, check this, check this. We did all that, it didn't work. So one of them we found out, you know, after we tore it apart, uh, the injector, and, and it, it may have worked, I don't know, but it, I wasn't willing to put it back on the engine uh, because we almost washed a set of rings out, was the uh, uh, bottom of the injector, the pinnel valve area, there's like a little disc that goes in there, and it was missing on the injector. The other three, had, it was four injectors. One, uh, three of them had it, the one didn't. It was just dumping fuel in the engine. So <clears throat> that probably was part of the, or a big part of the problem. But the, uh, the other thing is too, is the programs are not, um, the tables aren't designed right for a Pontiac engine. Just like you cannot run a Chevy Quadrajet on a Pontiac engine. You can run it, don't get me wrong. It'll go on, you can start the car, you could drive it, it'll run down the road. But it's not gonna make the same power. And uh, I learned that a long, long time ago. As you guys know, I'm a carburetor guy, and I like quadrajets. And I was playing with a bunch of different Q-jets on uh, uh, my car, and the, uh, I put a Chevy one that I had on there, and the car lost like a second and a half in the uh, quarter mile ET-wise. And, um, and I played with the jetting and everything, could not get it to come around. Then I finally realized when I took the thing apart, took the top off of it and everything, all the metering circuits and everything in there are totally different. And all those orifices have to be a certain diameter, All the and they're all timed. And if that doesn't work right, it's not gonna run right on the engine. So to answer your question, no, there's not a throttle body injection I will install on, a, on an engine until they perfect it. There's a new company that just came out, it's called Ace, I believe. And uh, I'm kinda anxious to see what their stuff's all about. And uh, I'll spend the money so you guys don't have to, and I'll let you know how that works out. But, but right now, I'm not impressed with any of the throttle bodies. Uh, let's see here. Phil the Third says, I just use a toggle switch for a gas pedal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Like an electric golf cart, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> On or off. Yep. And uh, Michael says, happy birthday, Dina, from Raven Racing. Yeah, I don't know if Dina's watching tonight, but happy birthday, Dina. Yep. That's my sister-in-law. And Waylon wants to know, what's your opinion on Pontiac cast connecting rods? Do you think they will hold up well, or are they ticking time bombs? No, that, shoot, I ran those things at uh, over 7,000 RPM and a 455 for years. Um, you have to put good bolts in them, get them mag, make sure there's no cracks in them, and polish the beams so there's no stress crack areas. But uh, they're actually, I don't know if, how many of you guys know this or not, uh, John Dornbush and uh, Phil III probably do because they've been around for a while, but the uh, Pontiac cast connecting rods are not iron, they're steel. So they're cast steel, which is a way stronger material, and uh, they don't break like a cast, uh, a normal cast connecting rod does. They're way tougher. I know a circle track guy that uh, in his uh, big block Chevy stuff that he ran on dirt, uh, he used Pontiac cast connecting rods in it. Um, Michael Gordon asked, have you guys ever raced at Thunder Valley, Bristol, Tennessee? I have not, but that would be a cool track to run at. Oh, and I missed one. Philip III said, I think he's using a Chevy engine. Oh, for the guy with asked about throttle body? I think so. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, even on the Chevy stuff, you know, they're about the same money to buy the Edelbrock Pro Flow 4. It's a port injected. It's not a, a throttle body injection. It does have a throttle body, but it comes with a distributor, it comes with a throttle body, ECU, all the wiring, everything you need. Intake manifold even. So yeah. it's ready to rock and roll for roughly the same price as what you're buying them throttle bodies for. Um, old School Twist says, I have to get some large port gaskets. I have my handfuls of braided ground wires and hopefully in the next couple of weeks I can start on hooking up my Terminator X Max. Ah, okay, yep. So you're gonna build your own EFI and that's good. And then Robert Johnson says, experience definitely <coughs> counts. Your OJT is beyond the level one techs. Well, thank you. I, uh, we've done a lot of stuff, and you know, I've been in business for 43 years, so I've seen a lot of stuff, made a lot of mistakes, and uh, spent a lot of money. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't mind sharing my knowledge with you guys to hopefully you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can get it right the first time. And uh, Bill says, where is this CO at? I'm assuming company. Um, which company is this? I'm not following. Uh, maybe the... Uh, Bill who? Rosenberger. Okay. Um, the last, um, what was the last um, fuel injection company you were talking about? Ace? Yeah. Oh, I don't, if he's talking about that, I don't know where they're located at. I just, they just, they're fairly new on the market and uh, uh, they, they kind of look like an FI tech or a Holly sniper is what it looks like, but it's a throttle body setup and I don't, I don't know much about them. I just seen them Actually, <clears throat> about two weeks ago, and I haven't really had any time to research them. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip III said, I knew they were tough, but I didn't know they were made of steel. Yeah, they're, they're a badass connecting rod. And Waylon says he thinks they are made out of Arma steel. Um, you know, so Arma steel. What is Arma steel? That's because <coughs> you got nodular uh, iron and you have Arma steel. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I hope that they're not made out of Arma Steel because I have had so many Arma Steel crankshafts for 421s and 389s that have been broke um, or cracked. It's crazy. And uh, I got a story to tell you guys. I sold a, um, a, kink, a crankshaft for a 389. This is a few years ago. It's probably 30 years ago. And I used to buy and sell a lot of parts, and I still do a little bit, but I used to really do that big time back 30 years ago. So, you know, I, I had a pretty good business going doing that, uh, besides doing carburetors on the side. But um, anyways, this guy purchased a uh, Arm Steel uh, 389 crankshaft from me, and uh, I had it turned for him and uh, magged and checked and everything. So... He uh, contacts me about 
oh, I don't know, maybe a week after he purchased the thing from me and uh, said, hey, I want my money back. This thing's cracked. And I said, oh, really? I said, I had it mag before I had it uh, ground. I says, I know it is not cracked. And I said, you know, basically I told him he wasn't getting his money back. And so next thing I know, Better Business Bureau, I get a letter from them. And uh, so he turned me into the Better Business Bureau, and then we had, and then he turned me into Small Claims Court. So I'm looking through the paperwork from the Small Claims Court, and it, and part of his, his evidence was his receipt for getting the crankshaft magnet fluxed. And uh, so I'm looking at the receipt, and I'm thinking, okay, uh, I know the business that that was magnet fluxed at, and uh, I look up at the date. Well, lo and behold, the date on his evidence that he provided was a month before he purchased the cam or crankshaft from me. So I contacted the uh, court and I said, did you by any chance look at the evidence for this uh, case? And uh, I got a male or a female magistrate and she goes, no, let me pull your file real quick. And I said, okay. I said, pull up uh, evidence B. And I said, does that look uh, kind of odd to you? And she says, uh, I don't think I'm following you. She said, it's a receipt for having a crank magnet fluxed and uh, showing it was cracked. And I said, yeah. I said, but look at the date. She goes, oh my God. Okay, no problem. Case solved. <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, I didn't give him his money back. <laughs> Steven says, oh, never mind. He said you answered the question already. Um, Philip III said he was talking about the guy with the green 58 uh, Pontiac. Um, that, there was a guy with, with a red 58 Pontiac that used to run up that way. I can't remember his name. Really good guy. He was a, uh, a Pontiac engine builder, had his own shop. And, uh, and I think it was actually his wife's car. And that was a that was a badass hot ride. I think it ran tens. And uh, let's see here. Okay, Waylon says, do you use the Pontiac cast rods in a lot of your engine builds, or do you upgrade to something else now? Well, now we use the uh, the forged uh, SIR I beam connecting rod for the like this <coughs> a lot of our street builds and we use the Eagle H beam uh, forged uh, 4340 steel rod for our higher end performance street engines and the reason is is because by the time you buy a set of rod bolts now for 75 bucks and and it costs almost 300 bucks now to recondition a set of rods after you put the rod bolts in it and mag them you're, you're talking almost four hundred dollars for a set of uh, reconditioned rods and and you still have a factory cast rod, not a forged steel rod. And you can buy the SIR I-beam connecting rods now for like 435 bucks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, why would you, for 35 or 40 bucks more, why wouldn't you upgrade to a forged rod? So we don't do it a whole lot anymore. It used to be was the most economical way to go, but labor was cheaper back then and uh, connecting rod bolts were only 30 bucks a set. And not to mention, we didn't have forged connecting rods for a long time for Pontiacs. Uh, Old School Twist said there are quite a few reviews of ACEs on YouTube. And Steven says ACE fuel injection kits are made in China. Uh, well, that answers that then. And John Dornbush said, my understanding was Arma Steel is just a trade name for by GM for a nodular crankshaft. Yeah, I don't know. All I know is I had a lot of them that were cracked. <clears throat> and we had several of them that were broke. And Philip III says, by the way, Don, checks in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, we're, if, he, if he's uh, true to his word, he doubled what he did last time. Yep. So we're up to three bucks now. We're making a killing. I know. We're in there. Yep. I'll be able to retire soon. And we're going to have to put Philip the Third sponsored this uh, channel. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's all the questions right now. So right. caught up. Well, yeah. So yeah, but, you know, this is a pretty cool idea. Hopefully, uh, 
Uh, Dave gets his car finished up. He's in a full, I mean, he's doing a full frame off build on this car right now. So he's got a lot, a lot of work ahead of him yet. Not to mention, I'm not done porting his heads for him yet either. So um, I don't know when he's going to start on the engine, but I think he's got a ways to go before he gets there. But we'll, we'll keep you guys abreast of what's going on. And uh, Dave posts on Facebook too. So I know for a fact that he'll be posting uh, ET numbers and whatever. So let me ask this. Uh, whenever you have the carburetor on here, everything's flat, right? Mm -hmm. So I've seen some intakes that have a, a kick angle to the back side of them. Why is that? Well, you think about what's going on when the engine sits in the engine bay, all right? So it, it's going to sit, in, like if this is the front of the car, it's going to sit at a little bit of an angle down, okay? So what they do, a lot of intake manifolds actually, factory intakes are actually built that way, and it's to keep the carburetor level so that the float level stays okay. right in the carburetor. So why doesn't Edelbrock do that? Yeah, that's a good question because I've asked that for years. They should have done that, but they never did. <laughs> but yeah, they always made them flat, and so your carburetor's actually sitting with the engine. Right. It's angled back like the engine. <coughs> but the factory did it so that the carburetor was sitting level, and which is the way to do it. And your boats are that way too. You know, the boat will have it so that it sits at level on the engine. Gotcha. Um, my next question would be is, okay, so when the air comes through with the fuel, does, everything just drops or does it does the air curve in the top and hit at the bottom and go in, or does it just hit and then go in? Well, so that, you know, that's a good question. So what, what happens is, depending on the airspeed, the, um, if it's a slower or lower RPM, it has more time and the air can actually make the turn. But then whenever the engine's uh, at higher RPMs, um, the air's still making the turn, but the fuel is not, because the fuel is heavier than the air is. So whenever the air makes that turn, the fuel drops out of it. And uh, that's why you want to raise the carburetor up to give that more time to uh, transition. And, uh, and have a, that's why line of sight is so important on an intake manifold. So when you look down that runner, intake runner, from like say the barrel of the carburetor here, you want a straight shot to that uh, port in the cylinder head. And that's what they, why they call it line of sight, because when you look down through there, you can see it's straight or not. And uh, the reason you want to do that is because of what we just talked about. Anytime that air has to make a turn any direction, that's why those old Offenhauser uh, dual quad intake manifolds, I'm amazed that those even run. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever seen one of those, <coughs> but the uh, carburetor sits way down low. They were doing it for hood clearance. So what they do is they, the runner goes like this, up and back down into the engine. And I'm thinking, okay, so that's making the nest turn in through that intake port. Every time it turns like that, it, the fuel's dropping out of the air. And, um, you know, we proved it on the chassis dyno. That um, uh, 62 Catalina I had the 400 engine in, uh, Clyde, I don't know if he's watching tonight or not, he bought the engine out of that, but before we, we sold it to him, we dynoed it on the chassis dyno. We did it with the dual quad setup. We did it with a Performer RPM, we did it with a Victor intake. And uh, believe it or not, the Victor intake manifold made more torque than the Performer RPM and the dual quad setup. Hmm. And, uh, and it made the most horsepower too. So that's hmm. what we ended up leaving on the car. <coughs> and that's because these are raised up more of a straight shot than the other you one. You got a better line of sight, yeah. And with a dual plane intake manifold, you know, you get the, the runners are stacked and you, you got a lot of that, you know, going on in that too. So dual plane intake manifolds are known to be low RPM, high torque, and uh, single planes are known to be high RPM and uh, higher RPM horsepower uh, with a loss of torque at low, down low. But uh, because of the runner length on this Victor intake manifold compared to what it is on the RPM intake and on that Offenhauser, this intake actually made more torque than both those other intake manifolds. Hmm. Uh, Waylon uh, asked, any experiences from the early Ford rods? I think some engines 1966 and older had them. Yeah, they were actually in the 1963 and older engines. Some 64 engines had them too. 
<clears throat> and, and we used to, I had a guy that would go to the junkyard for me and, and scrounge out of those old engines because all the old engines had forged rods in them back then. And uh, so he, and they're all the same length from 1955 up. So he would go, you know, knock the pistons out of there and grab all the connecting rods out of these engines for me. Hindsight being what it is, I wish I'd have got all those engines and kept them all. But anyway, <laughs> that's what we did back in the day because that was the only forged connecting rod we had. The only bad thing about them was is they were really soft. They they call them butter rods, and uh, you had to heat treat them or else they weren't they were not as good as a cast rod. Yeah, and that's what we well. Philip III said, I know that forged rods were a thing on the Super Duties, uh, 421 Super Duties, 455s on the later ones. Yep. Uh, Wayland said, yeah, I think the 421 Super Duty rods were heat treated on the production. Yep. Um, and they were a different material, too. Uh, <coughs> the ones that came in the everyday passenger cars, they were different. They were a softer uh, uh, iron or steel. They weren't the same heat steel makeup. I think so, the, the 4140 is what the Super Duty rods were. So Pontiac, I didn't know Pontiac had a Super Duty 455 and a regular 455. Oh, yeah. Yep. So the 455, regular 455, just had your standard cast rods and stuff like that. And then your Super Duty had the better rods and better cam and uh, probably round port heads. It was probably their best production engine ever <clears throat> built. Um, regular production engine had the highest horsepower um, because it had the best cylinder head. Uh, they had a trick round port like a Ram Air 4, mm -hmm. uh, but the intake port was bigger and they actually mm -hmm. put tubes in the intake ports uh, because for the push rods because oh. the port was wider and bigger. And, and it was specially designed, they actually t took the floor down and back up again, uh, created like a, uh, like a waterfall or ski effect over top of the uh, short turn on the head and it's got a long short turn in the head too. Hmm. So it's a really really good cylinder head. Um, I've seen uh, super stockers uh, and that those guys are limited to the factory compression ratio which is um, nine I think they rated them at nine to one but uh, those guys will with the way the rules were written they end up being right real close to ten to one. But even so that's not a lot of compression. And with those uh, factory iron heads, uh, there's guys making 700 horsepower. Wow. That's, a, that's an incredible head. But, yeah, basically the 455 Super Duty had a, it had a cast crank in it. I, it had a different part number, so I don't know if it was a different material or not, but hmm. it was cast. Uh, but they had a four-bolt block, and the block was reinforced in the lifter area. Oh, wow. And the oil pan rail. So if you, how rare is the 455 Super Duty block then? Um, they made quite a few of them because there's a lot of service replacement ones over the counter that you could buy, and mm. and I've I've probably had 40 or 50 of those in my career of building Pontiac engines. Not to mention I've built probably I don't know 100 Super Duty motors. So, so if, if I found one and used it for a race motor and, and well, you don't want to want to do that if it came out of a production car because the Super Duty cars were rare. Right. So the the actual cars built there for both years, I think it's, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say it's less than 1,500 for both years, 73 and 74. Hmm. I don't remember exact numbers now. It's hell getting old. I used to remember all that stuff, and I forgot. <laughs> Uh, Mark Marshall says, I will end up swapping top ends with your new round ports, a FIPF4 Victor and a more aggressive cam. This current build we get will get my car set up to handle another 100 horse. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <coughs> It'll be fun. Mark, Mark built a badass hot rod. He's got a uh, Trans Am that uh, uh, he had us uh, build him a uh, all aluminum uh, 500 cubic inch motor with uh, Edelbrock. Uh, SD performance ported CNC ported heads and and that's got a custom ground uh, hydraulic roller cam in it um, and it's aluminum block so it, it's a it's a really nice piece and uh, I don't like sh sh you know telling dyno numbers or anything because it's irrelevant <clears throat> what matters to me is what that ET slip says but uh, he's got enough horsepower he should be able to uh, put a 4,000-pound car in a low 11s, high 10s hmm. on pump gas. 
Uh, Waylon wants to know how good are the 455 standard duty or standard duty super duty rods. I have some of them here also. What's, what was the question again? How good are the 455 Super Duty rods? They actually made several different runs of those. <clears throat> and, it, and you can find this information online because, again, I forgot what I, I, I forgot. What I forgot. But anyway, um, they had a, a batch of uh, connecting rods that were uh, breaking. And they lettered their batches. So I think it was like C through F or something I don't know maybe John Dornbush remembers but uh, they uh, they had a batch of them that you don't want to use and uh, I don't know if you could fix them or not but uh, I think they had too much heat treat done to them or something he said that his have a 716 bolt yeah they all came with 716 bolts oh, okay um, and John Dorbush says he's not much for connecting rods back in the day oh Pontiac didn't have much for connecting rods back in the day he ended up buying a set of Crowler billet rods for his blown engine back in 78 for 800 bucks. <laughs> That's a lot of money back in 78. <laughs> uh, BNR Racing says, I have used the Pontiac cast rods also racing, never broke one. They're good connecting rods. I, I mean, I had a guy that uh, he blew up his engine, uh, and again, you know, he wanted me to fix it for him for nothing, and then uh, <laughs> he brings me this engine. And I said, well, let me see what you got going on. Because I'll never tell anybody, no, I'm not going to fix it. If, if it's my fault, I'll fix it. So I told him, I said, bring me the engine. I want to see it. So he backs up with his pickup truck, puts the tailgate down. He's all pissed off, and he's mad at me. And, and I'm looking at this thing, and I said, uh, uh, I'm gonna, I won't mention any names to protect the innocent. But anyway, um, I'm looking at the engine. And the connecting rods are still bolted to the crankshaft, which is in two different pieces. But the <laughs> connecting rods are broke right down the center. And uh, these are cast rods. So I said, you know what? Just out of, for shits and giggles, let's take a rod off the crankshaft and look at it. And the bearings look brand new in this thing. So anyhow, <laughs> he brought his buddy with him. And his buddy ratted him out. He says, I told you the thing wouldn't take 8,000 RPM burnouts. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, they don't hold up to 8,000 RPM with a factory head. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. um, Philip, the, Philip the Third said they have had three 455s, the 455 Super Duty, the 455 High Output, or HO, yep. and then the regular 455. Yeah, the HOs were pretty much like the regular 455, except for they had four bolt mains and a better head. Okay, so that was like almost a step down. So the Super Duty is like the crown. That, that's the king, yep. Okay. Those, them are the sweet ones. And uh, Philip, so Philip the Third said you could find 455 regulars in some of the Bonnevilles, Catalinas, and Grand Prix. Save the HO and the uh, Super Duties. Well, you know, and that it is odd that you know what I've had. Um, I had a guy bring me an engine out of a '73 uh, Safari station wagon, uh, 455, and <coughs> it was a Super Duty block. Didn't have any of the other parts in it, but it was a four bolt main Super Duty reinforced block. Huh. And and it didn't have the Super Duty code on the front of it either. Wow. Had a, the uh, Safari engine code for that horsepower. Was it still listed as a 455? Yeah, it was a 455, huh. but it it wasn't a it wasn't a stamped a 455 Super Duty, wow. so I don't know how that ended up in that station wagon, but it did, and because <laughs> I seen it. <laughs> um, Mike Polson says hi, Don and Brandon. Sorry, I just tuned in. Just got home from Summit Racing, spending money. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, brother. Got to keep that economy going. That's right. <laughs> uh, BNR Racing said Ellen. L N M Super Duty 455 NOS rods I owned and raced on. Yeah, cool. And John Dornbush, the Pontiac Super Duty 455 heads were developed by Airflow Research for Pontiac, I believe. Yep, they were. And BNR Racing said it was a through MSD 455 rods, as far as he can recall. Okay, good info because I can't remember. Luke says he's in school watching the live. <laughs> the hell's he doing in school this late? Uh, he had some kind of a, they had some kind of a showcase thing tonight, and he's part of that. 
Ah. His teacher wanted him to stay after today. Um, Waylon said, uh, what's the safe RPM limit for Pontiac cast rods? Um, apparently it's not 8,000 RPM. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that firsthand. I would say realistically, as long as you got a good cylinder head on it, I really don't think there is a, a uh, I mean, obviously anything over uh, 7,000 RPM probably uh, you're pushing it, but, uh, you know, I've, I've ran factory cast rods in all my 455s back in the day and never, never, knock on wood, broke a connecting rod. And we shifted at 7,200 RPM, and I raced for 15 years with the same set of rods. So I never broke one. Uh, Philip III said, I can believe that about the station wagon. My grandfather gave me, or gave him one to, or gave one to his older brother. Yeah, I just, I couldn't believe that a Super Duty block was used. It had regular heads and everything else, but it was Super Duty block. Hmm. Um, <coughs> BNR Racing said, I have hit 8,000 RPMs by accident on factory Pontiac cast rods. Missed a shift from third to fourth on a Mincy four speed. <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. And that, uh, and I've done that too. I, I Sustained RPM, I'm not sure it would handle that, but uh, just a quick, you know, boom, it goes up there. Yeah, I could see that happening. That brings up another story real quick, not not the, with the factory connecting rod, but uh, my first Ram Air 5 uh, test mule that I built uh, with my, uh, my cylinder heads, uh, I had it in my uh, race car, and, um, and I had no idea how fast that engine was going to rev. So anyway, uh, I don't know why my, well, yeah, I do know why. We took the rev limiter chip out of it because we knew the engine was going to go higher than the 455 I had in it before, which the rev limiter was set at 6,200. So I pulled the chip out of it to do a burnout with this thing. And uh, so I pulled this thing down in low gear and I hammered a throttle and boom, it hit the 10,000 RPM peg on the tech. <laughs> scared the living shit. I, I shut the engine off and got out of the car. It scared me so bad I couldn't even hardly stand up because I thought, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> 10,000 RPM? <laughs> Fortunately, I got the, the, after a few beers, I got the guts to start the thing back up to listen to it again, and we ended up racing that engine. Didn't hurt it a bit. I couldn't believe it. But 10 grand. <laughs> so then after that, because I had a manual power body, I did all my burnouts in high gear. <laughs> then I could control it. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, Mark Marshall said a good friend of his has a 74 Super Duty 455 Trans Am nice. automatic stock. Wants right. to put a cam in it. Any recommend, recommendations for that compression level? Can you tweak the carburetor to run with the cam? Oh, absolutely. There's, there's lots of things that you can do with that. <coughs> and, um, and I don't know, uh, John Dornbush and them guys probably know, but uh, Pontiac Motor Division actually... Um, had a cam that was very similar to the Ram Air 4 cam, and uh, they dyno tested with that, with 11 to 1 compression and the Holley carburetor and a set of headers, and I think the heads were stock on that 455 SD they dynoed, uh, and this is a hydraulic, or yeah, I think it was a hydraulic flat tappet cam, uh, because the cam that comes in the Super Duty is actually a pretty good cam. It's actually the Ram Air 3 four-speed cam, but they put the uh, Ram Air 4 camshaft in that engine and it I've got the dyno sheet here because a, a customer of mine used to work at PMD and he uh, copied a bunch of that stuff for me and uh, and I've got it in a file but it made 500 and I want to say it was 520 horsepower wow yeah so it was a th th them heads worked really well on that engine and that was with a factory intake huh uh, Philip III said Pontiacs make torque. Use that instead of uh, the R's. Yeah, with the traditional Pontiac head, with the with the Ram Air 5 heads that we have now, that the they still make a shitload of torque, but now we can buzz them things at 8,000 RPM. Uh, old School Twist said the SD blocks in the Safari wagons may not have been so far fetched as lots of them pulling uh, pulled camping trailers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe they thought they needed it. Maybe it was a heavy-duty version for the uh, towing package or something. I don't know. That's well, a, that's a lot of car, too. It is a lot of car. <laughs> yep. I couldn't believe it, though. That customer brought me out and says, you know what you got here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, Waylon said, that's pretty good for cast rods. I heard a lot of stories about them snapping in two of the beams. I had pretty good luck with cast rods so far. Yeah, if you mag them and get rid of the stress uh, risers on the sides of the rods, uh, I see no reason why they can't go to 7,000 RPM all the time. And then uh, Malcolm Curry says that's the way to break in uh, uh, 10 grand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you want to be ready for it. That made my butthole pucker. I'll tell you what, that scared the living daylights out of me. I probably look like a ghost after after that happened. Um, BNR Racing said all the reported Pontiac cast rod fail. Uh, he would say it was due to severe engine misfire taking place or engine ran low on oil. I consider it considered misuse by the owner. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone that I know that's broke those connecting rods, they're out doing 8,000 RPM burnouts with a, <laughs> through a straw with a little peanut port. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool. Oh, it's, it, is. It, sounds like, it sounds awesome whenever you're revving that big old engine up like that. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. And Philip the Third says, I have never had a problem with Pontiac rods, no matter what. Yeah, I've never had a problem with connecting rods. You know, it's, it's, we've had trouble with bearings, and we went through a spell there back in the 90s with, uh, uh, I won't tell, mention manufacturer because I don't do that, but we had a, man, a couple manufacturers we were buying <coughs> bearings from back then. They were delaminating and, and spinning, and we were having all kinds of fits with those stupid things. And you know, that's something that really irritates me is that, you know, my customer, they think I did something wrong. I've been building engines for a long time. If we have a problem, there's something went wrong. I don't know what it is yet until we take it apart, but when whenever they come in here and they want to start yelling at me and blaming me for the problem, and they don't even know what the problem is yet, uh, that isn't the way to solve the problem. We need to work together, put our heads together, talk about it, keep the tempers down, or away, we don't even need a temper. And then uh, let's figure out what's going on. And, and if it's something I did, I'm gonna help you. If it's something that you did, you're on your own. If it's something the manufacturer did, I'm still gonna help you, but we gotta pay for it, both of us. So it just, it is what it is. You know, nobody likes to, uh, likes it when an engine fails and nobody likes to have to pay for uh, something two times. But you know what, shit happens, it's life. What can I do? You know, I'm not God, I can't make, I don't make all the parts, I just put them in. <coughs> um, well, so a lot of great information here, and uh, John Dornbush said he has he heard the factory tested their rods at 3,500 RPM for 20 minutes, and that was all that they expected out of them. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hardly believe that. Maybe 24 hours. Um, Philip the Third said, "Me too. I I've had one spun bearing." Yep, that'll happen. You know, sometimes that'll happen. The bearing fails or whatever. Or dirty oil, you know, that's a big thing. You gotta keep your oil clean. And then uh, BNR Racing said the Pontiac cast rods were manufactured same way in the Cadillac 472 and 500. I haven't done a lot of Cadillac engines. I've done two or three, but I'm not in any depth. But I'm actually gonna be getting a Cadillac engine here next week. And why were the other than the fact that they're Cadillacs and they're huge, but why were the Cadillac motors always like big cubic inch motors? Because their cars weigh 6,000 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> they got tanks. I mean, I don't think... You I'm, need a big inch engine to it, move that well, big car. I know, but good <coughs> Lord. I mean, that's I mean, it's impressive. I will give them that, but... Yeah, 472s and 500s. I mean, you got factory pro stock engines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's, uh, I don't know why the Cadillac engine didn't gain more popularity for uh, performance guys because back in the day, back when people were building rat rods back in the, you know, the 50s and 60s, they used Cadillac engines in a lot of them. I mean, they weren't 500-inch Cadillac engines back were then. Were the but. cylinder heads junk? Like, couldn't they not get them to flow right? Or Well, that could have been improved. I mean, we could, you know, if there was a demand for them, I'd make an aluminum head for them. I, I mean, that's just uh, crazy to me because you got a factory 500 cubic inch motor. motor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I'm sure you could probably go to the junkyard and get them for next to nothing. You can. You can still find them for cheap. So, I mean, that's just crazy to me. Yep. Wayland said, how good are the Eagle 5140 forged I-beam stock replacement rods? 
uh, having experience with them. Those are decent. You know what? I, I, I wouldn't use them for uh, a high horsepower deal, but I would use them anything up to 500 horsepower on the street. I don't see any reason why you couldn't. They, uh, you know, I, I'm always leery of anything coming out of China. So that's my disclaimer. I don't, I, you know, I, honestly, I would, I would have more faith in the factory steel cast rod than I would that I-beam rod for a higher horsepower deal. Uh, but up to 500 horsepower, we've never seen any failures with them yet. Uh, BNR Racing said the LS uses powder metal rods. I Most know. <laughs> modern diesel engines use po uh, powder metal rods. I that is amazing Pontiac to me. cast rods are better. <laughs> that is amazing to me. How does a powdered metal rod last? Right. That's just crazy. And and uh, he what he didn't share with you is, and, uh, and I know he knows, but... How they separate those is they got to uh, put a scribe mark on them and they fracture them. That's how they separate the cap. They're cast in one mm -hmm. piece and they have to crack them apart. So every rod is unique. Every cap goes with that rod. You cannot change them from rod to rod. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that just, that's just wild. And, they, <laughs> and these guys have thrown turbos on these things. I know. <laughs> you know, it with 150,000 miles on I know. And they, then, they go boom, but still. Yeah, they don't care. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, they used to be really cheap. I mean, they have gone up in price now, but. Yeah, LS engines aren't as cheap as they used to no. be. Because, I mean, I remember, you know, guys that I worked with at Coca-Cola, they go blow one up, and they're like, I don't care. I'll just go to the junkyard and get another one. They yeah. would have eight of them sitting in the garage. Well, you can get apart. a 4.8 or a 5.3 for 500 bucks. Yeah. You can't get them for that cheap no more. Nope. Junkyards are onto us. Hot riders are selling them for more. Yep. <coughs> um, John Dornbush put uh, asked, "Have you came up with anything about that engine failure from a few weeks ago with the crankshaft damage in the lifter?" Yeah, we do believe that was a uh, valve or drive line. That um, there's some other things that, that I'll share with you after I talk to the owner before I share with you guys. But um, I definitely know it's not the engine now. Uh, we checked the crankshaft, the balance was fine on the crank, and, um, and so there was nothing wrong with the engine. It was definitely in the drive line. Now we just got to figure out what it is. Yeah. Philip the third said, I got to go talk to you guys next week. See you later, Philip. And Waylon uh, asked, how good are the stock connecting rod bolts in the cast rods? Uh, the factory bolt is the problem with the cast rod. If you, if you don't replace the bolts, you're just begging for trouble. And usually you recommend ARP. Yeah, we use ARPs. We used to use uh, Milodon, and believe it or not, Mopar Performance, uh, hmm. because that rod bolt works perfect in a Pontiac rod. <coughs> um, and Waylon well, also asked, what connecting rod would you recommend for a Ram Air 5 build around 700 horse and 700 or 7,000 RPM plus? We use the uh, Eagle H-Beam uh, 4340s all the time, but we use a better bolt in them. We use the uh, L19 or the 2000 series bolt. And Tim says, looking forward to next week's podcast. Have a good night, Don and Branding. Good night, Tim. Good night, Tim. And, I mean, it is 8.03, so, yep. uh, well, if you have any more questions, feel free to keep, um, don't do it on this one. Wait for the video to come up, and you can ask on that. My dad will get back to you, or you can email him. Uh, DCI Motorsports SBC Global.net. Yep. So I think we're going to wrap it up tonight, yep. fellas, and uh, make sure and uh, come see us next week. We're going to have uh, Greg with the badass 57 Pontiac Gasser on the show. So. Yep, that'd be cool. Yep. All right. Good night, everybody. Good.